The organism I selected for this project is Borrelia burgdorferi, most commonly known for its ability to cause Lyme disease in humans. This bacterium is a flexible helical spirochete that is pleomorphic or able to change morphology based on environmental conditions. A unique characteristic is that its flagella is actually located between the inner and outer membranes in the periplasm. This allows the bacterium to better move through viscous layers, which, to no surprise, aids in its ability to invade a host tissue. Another characteristic is the outer membrane surface proteins, or OSPs. OSPA and OSPC likely play a role in transmission of the disease. Inside the gut, OSPA proteins are more present, indicating they help keep the bacteria in the tick gut. However, inside an infected mammal, OSPC proteins are more present, indicating that they may play a role in releasing the microbe to the tick salivary gland so it can release into the host during attachment. B. burgdorferi contains around 910 kilobase pairs in its linear chromosome, as well as 610 kilobases of plasma DNA, both circular and linear. Its phylogenetic classification is as follows. Domain, bacteria, phylum, spirochaeta, class, spirochaetia, order, spirochaetales, family, Borrelia AC, genus, Borrelia, species, burgdorferi. Two of its relatives are B. acelli and B. guarani, which also can cause Lyme disease. Like many bacteria, it uses glucose and other carbohydrates for its nutrition. In acetylglucosamine is the essential nutrient for its growth, which happens to be a component of chitin, which makes up the tick cuticle. The organism's genome also codes for several transport proteins like ABC transporters and enzymes, which likely allow it to bring in nutrients from the environment. Finally, its main method of ATP production is via substrate-level phosphorylation and the pentose phosphate pathway. B. burgdorferi likely does not contain the mechanics necessary to interact with other microorganisms. There are two pieces of evidence to support this. First, when there are increases in Pseudomonas, Bacillus, and other bacteria in the environment, B. burgdorferi numbers go down. In addition, it appears that there is not a huge diversity in the microbiome of ticks gut, which would allow B. burgdorferi to populate there. B. burgdorferi's interactions with other organisms play a key role in its ability to survive and its pathological impact. So the artwork I did here was to demonstrate the infection cycle of ticks. We start here with number one, where an adult tick lays eggs. Two, those eggs hatch into larvae. Then, in number three, the larvae may feed on an infected mammal, thereby acquiring the bacteria. Here, the tick will grow into an adult, and then will feed on another mammal. And then later on, the tick will drop off this animal to lay its eggs, and the cycle continues. Now, at number four where there's an infected nymph if that nymph happens to come into contact with a human and is able to latch on for long enough to pass B. burgdorferi then that human may acquire Lyme disease. Upon a bite from an infected tick there are three stages of infection. First in days to weeks following exposure erythema migrans may appear at the bite site. During the second stage once the disease has spread via the blood and lymphatic system, people may experience headaches, neck stiffness, fever, or chills. They may also undergo neurologic abnormalities and on occasion cardiac problems. Finally, the third stage is marked by sporadic episodes of arthritis affecting large joints and or chronic neurologic swelling. Thankfully, there are many antibiotic options available for each stage of the disease. However, some people report ongoing arthritic and neurologic conditions even after excessive antibiotic treatment. All right, the microorganism that I will be talking about today is Borrelia burgdorferi. Borrelia burgdorferi is a bacteria that is gram negative and is a microaerophile. As for its shape and anatomy, it is a loosely coiled spirochet um, bacteria that is 5 to 20 micrometers long and up to 0 0.5 micrometers wide. It has a cell wall that consists of a plasma membrane, a peptidoglycan layer, and an outer membrane. 
Um, they also have periplasmic flagella throughout which um, throughout the organism, which is where it gains its motility. As for interactions with other microorganisms and the environment, Borrelia burgdorferi is also known as Lyme disease, and it's caused by, and trans, well, it is transmitted to humans by the bite of infected ticks. These ticks become infected when they feed on birds or mammals that carry this bacterium in their blood. Increased seasonal human activity in woodland areas can increase risk of Lyme disease and uh, transmits through the skin, spreading hematogenously or lymphatically to other organs. Uh, the pathological, the pathological impacts that this bacteria has would be, as I previously mentioned, Lyme disease on humans. And typical symptoms of the Lyme disease would include fever, headache, fatigue, and a characteristic skin rash that is known as a bullseye rash. And it usually occurs um, in approximately 60 to 80% of infected people. And it begins at the site of a tick bite after a delay of 3 to 30 days. A distinctive feature of this rash is that it gradually expands peripherally over a period of several days, which is where it gains its name from. Several weeks or months may pass before the host immune system gains control of this infection, which will occur despite of the presence of antibiotics. And if it's not treated, this biocheck can survive in localized parts of the body for several years, ultimately causing arthritis or neurological impacts. But most cases of Lyme disease can be treated successfully with a few weeks of antibiotics, such as amoxicillin. As for interactions with other microorganisms, Borrelia burgdorferi establishes residence within the tick gut. And within this environment, the sprouchia impacts interacts with other bacteria within the gut microbiome and with tick gut proteins in order to remain viable. As for uh, metabolism and growth, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi are maintained in nature through infectious uh, mammal and tick cycles. They're fastidious, slow growing microaerophile bacteria. Um, in host or rich growth mediums, they rely solely on glycolysis for ATP production, and they are completely dependent on the transport of nutrients and cofactors from extracellular sources. As for its phylogeny, um, Borrelia burgdorferi is able to survive in both mammal and tick hosts through careful modulation of its gene expression. Um, it is from the family Spirochetake, and its close relatives are Borrelia garini and Borrelia afzeli. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is distinguished from relatives by its flagellin genes, and its family consists of two groups, one that causes Lyme disease and another that causes relapsing fever. If the name itself didn't, didn't give it away, it is a caucus-shaped bacterial species arranged as the Staphylococcus. It is also gram-positive and halotolerant. It is a facultative anaerobe, so it primarily prefers an aerobic environment. However, in an anaerobic environment, it can ferment different sugars, uh, primarily lactose when available. It is a low GNC content species, and it can produce catalase, which actually is unusual for a bacterial species that has a low GNC content. It is found in the environment and is a normal component of the human microbiome. 
um, among other Staphylococcus species. Um, one of note and one primarily found within the microbiome is going to be uh, Staphylococcus epidermitis, where you will find Staph aureus um, within and um, on the human body would be in the nasal cavity and upper respiratory tract, moist skin folds, the gastrointestinal tract, and the urogenital tracts. Commensal bacterial species aid in the regulation of Staph aureus, Ascendentibacter baumannii being one of note, um, along with species from Streptococcus and corny bacteria, as well as other Staphylococcus species, which include Hominis, Epidermitis, and Lugdenensis. A. baumannii is commonly found in wound cultures where Staph aureus is also present, and it actually exhibits strain specific antagonistic characteristics towards Staph aureus, meaning that specific strains of A. baumannii will have very specific effects against specific strains of Staph aureus. It is pathogenic and can cause a number of serious and potentially fatal infections. Uh, starting with skin infections, we have folliculitis, which is redness and swelling um, around one or a few different hair follicles, which can then spread into surrounding tissue or can spread deeper into different layers of the skin and into the muscle. Scalded skin syndrome, which is a product of exfoliative toxins produced by S. aureus that cause the skin to slough off, which then leaves someone in a very vulnerable state of secondary infections, which is where a lot of the problems and complications will arise. And then necroti necrotizing fasciitis um, is a development of different um, skin infections from Staph aureus, specifically from methicillin-resistant strains. It is very rare and is known as flesh-eating bacteria. Bacteremia, um, which are bloodstream infections, are also uh, very common with Staph aureus. Anytime you have a skin infection, you will take blood samples to see if it has um, infected the blood, and it can cause... Um, a number of serious um, syndromes, illnesses, diseases, such as osteomyelitis, endocarditis, and toxic shock syndrome, which toxic shock syndrome can be fatal. Antibiotic resistance is very important when talking about Staphylococcus aureus. Um, it is considered to be a superbug. Um, Staph aureus developed resistance to penicillin, which was the first antibiotic uh, discovered in the 1940s. Very, very quickly, and roughly 80% of strains of Staph aureus today will be resistant to penicillin. In the late 1950s, around 1959-ish, methicillin was developed as a semi-synthetic form of penicillin, which could still work on Staph aureus. And by like 1960, 1961, um, resistance was detected in some strains of Staph aureus and is commonly known as uh, MRSA or MRSA. And today, roughly 80 to 90 percent of strains will be um, methicillin resistant. Uh, and MRSA is not only resistant to um, methicillin, but also to macrolides, aminoglycosides, and cephalosporins, which are different types of antibiotics. Vancomycin very quickly became the antibiotic of choice around the 1980s, but very quickly in the 1990s, resistance was discovered in some strains of MRSA itself, and is known as uh, vancomycin resistant Staph aureus or Versa. Um, there are still some antibiotics that are shown to be effective against MRSA, and those would be um, things like rifampin and Bactrim, um, but it's also led to the research into vaccines, which would be used primarily in folks who are high risk or have high susceptibility um, to getting MRSA infections, um, which fun fact would primarily be folks who are regularly in the hospital or in the hospitals for a long amount of time, as that's one of the most common places to pick up a Staph aureus infection, and that is Staphylococcus aureus. Escherichia coli. In 19th century Europe, diarrhea was a leading cause of infant mortality. German pediatrician Theodor Escherich sought to understand why, and in doing so, was the first to isolate what would become the most widely studied of all bacteria. E. coli is a gram-negative member of the proteobacteria phyla and the gamma proteobacteria class, and it's a glycolytic facultative anaerobe. It belongs to the family Enterobacteriaceae, and all members of this family have an outer membrane containing lipopolysaccharide and lipid A, and they colonize the intestines of animals. In this chart, we can see how various gut bacteria are different from one another. 
you can pause the video to check it out. It's pretty cool. And here's a summary of some of E. coli's physical features. E. coli loves sugar. It can eat glucose, fructose, galactose, lactose, sucrose, maltose, and raffinose, just to name a few. Oh, it can also metabolize amino acids. One reason E. coli is so successful is because it is metabolically flexible. It can adapt to eating a variety of things in a variety of ways. Here are some of the metabolic pathways it can use. In addition to glycolysis, it can also use these other pathways. And when there's no final electron receptors, it can ferment. Within our intestines, all of this work amounts to, being, uh, amounts to helping us break down molecules to aid in digestion. E. coli can't metabolize big sugars like starch, but it can commensally hang out with other members of the GI community that can. These bacteria break lar larger polysaccharides into smaller ones that E. coli prefers. This is an example of a strain of E. coli that is now sold as a probiotic. It was isolated from a German soldier during World War I. The guy seemed to be resistant to infection from Shigella, unlike his comrades. Thankfully for us, E. coli is competitive. It inhibits the growth of transient enteric pathogens like Shigella, Salmonella, and other strains of E. coli. Embedded in E. coli's outer membrane are lipopolysaccharide antigens. The combinations of these antigens give us different serotypes. There are 700 different known serotypes of E. coli, and given all the different combinations possible, there could be as many as 100,000 different serotypes out there. Disease-causing strains of E. coli can be grouped based on the conditions and symptoms they cause. E. hec, also known as S. tech, is the most famous. These antigens are present in E. coli serotypes most associated with disease. So E. coli is supposed to be in the intestines, but when it ends up in other parts of the body, it often becomes the causative pathogen of serious infections like in these examples. Here are some virulence factors. The Shiga toxin is named that because it was first identified in the Shigella bacteria, which is a close relative of Escherichia. About 36% of the quarter million or so reported cases of EHEC in the US are caused by one strain, 0157H7, which produces the Shiga-like toxin. 62% of EHEC cases in Oregon have bloody diarrhea, and 24% of EHEC cases in Oregon require hospitalization. About 5 to 15% of patients diagnosed with an EHEC infection also develop hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a type of kidney failure. E. coli strain 0157H7 lives in the intestines of cows and other animals. These animals' tissues do not have a specific receptor for the Shiga-like toxin, and therefore this strain doesn't harm them. In this way, these animals are a reservoir for this strain. Transmission of EHEC causing strains of E. coli is done by the fecal-oral route. A few sources of transmission are when water that has been contaminated by cattle is used to water crops from undercooking meat, poor hand hygiene, and by direct transmission in the healthcare or daycare settings. An example of a major outbreak, in 1993, contaminated beef patties from Jack in the Box infected 732 people in four states. Unfortunately, four children lost their lives due to kidney failure. As a result of this outbreak, state governments now require the reporting of infections of this strain, and the FDA now re recommends cooking hamburgers at a hotter temperature. Because E. coli is such an important part of our normal gut microbiome, health professionals generally do not recommend antibiotics to treat diarrhea or food poisoning. Most people with E. coli infections start to feel better after about a week. Here's a cool factoid. Every mammal on the planet is colonized with Escherichia coli, even orca. Thanks. This is Forrest, and I'm presenting about Mycobacterium leprae. 
This is the bacteria that causes leprosy or Hansen's disease. It's an obligate intracellular parasite. It cannot be cultured. It's characterized by very slow growth, prefers cool parts of the human body, and is a very close relative to Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's part of the genus Mycobacterium phylomactinobacteria. It's gram positive and has high GC content. This bacteria is between 1 and 8 micrometers long and 0.3, about 0.3 micrometers in diameter. It's rod-shaped, can be slightly curved or straight, and has rounded ends. It does not form endospores. It's gram-positive. Importantly, its cell walls contain mycolic acid. Um, this impacts many of the characteristics of this bacteria, including its very slow growth um, and its ability to live within phagocytes. It also requires a different kind of staining technique. It also has a capsule, and it very closely resembles Mycobacterium tuberculosis. In terms of metabolism, it is aerobic. It takes 12, about 12 days to double, which is very slow. It grows best at about 30 degrees Celsius, preferring cooler regions of the human body, like the skin, peripheral nerves, eyes, upper respiratory tract, anything that's cool. It generates, it does generate its own ATP, um, uses glycolysis, um, citric acid cycle, but it depends upon its host for a large part of metabolism and for nutrition and has extremely reduced the genes in its genome, um, preserving only what it needs really to survive, relying on the host for the rest. It also, it does have a robust lipid, uh, it, metabolism though, and can synthesize many types of lipids. I did not find much information about the interactions of this microbe with other microorganisms. However, it greatly interacts with its hosts, um, mainly humans and armadillos. It primarily targets Schwann cells, which wrap our nerves and help conduct nerve pulse impulses, and macrophages, part of our cell-mediated mediated immune system. Interestingly, it's the only known pathogen capable of infecting human peripheral nerves. How bad the presentation of leprosy in a, a person is uh, depends in part on how many bacteria are present in the tissues. There's a spectrum of the disease ranging from pausibacillary to multibacillary. In PB, there's just a few bacilli in the host tissues and this the person's body had a strong immune response and leprosy or the disease never really got a, a strong hold in the body, whereas in multibacillary disease, there, uh, over many years, there can be up to billions of bacilli in the host tissue, and this happens when there wasn't a very strong immune response to the bacteria in the beginning. The symptoms of leprosy are going to present differently based on how advanced the disease is, but in skin, uh, you're going to be experiencing numbness, uh, discolored patches, uh, rash, uh, growths, bumps, ulcers on the feet. Um, in terms of nerve damage, again, numbness, um, weakness, paralysis in more ex uh, advanced cases, um, nerve enlargement, um, red areas, swollen areas, um, eye problems, blindness. In, in advanced cases, we're going to be seeing the reabsorption of extremities. There, the skin is not decaying or dying, it's, it's being reabsorbed by the body. Um, loss of nasal tissue, blindness, disfigurement, paralysis. It can be very serious, but only after many years. It takes many, many years to develop to this point. Despite how feared this disease has been for thousands of years um, and how disfiguring it can be, it actually takes years to contract to develop this disease and it takes a very long time to actually catch it. It's not very vir virulent. It's, it can be treated and it's not very difficult to treat. You just have to have access to treatment. You use a multi-drug therapy, multiple antibiotics, and it takes one to two years to complete. If you don't have a very advanced disease, you, you, uh, it is treated with Dapsone and Rifampicin, and in an advanced case, it's treated with Dapsone, Rifampicin, and Clofazamine. This was such an interesting organism to study, and there's so much more to say. 
it's also a very difficult organism to study because it cannot be cultured. Thank you for listening to my presentation. For this presentation, we're looking at the microorganism Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is a gram-negative, non-fermenting, non-sporulating, microaerophilic bacteria. It's about two to four micrometers long with a diameter of about one half to one micrometers. It has a helical shape uh, with about two to seven Lophotrichus flagella at the end. Uh, that means that all the flagella are um, used for movement in one direction. Um, it does come in a couple other shapes, um, but the other shapes are not as useful, just in rods or curved. Uh, the spiral shape is the one that's most successful uh, and impactful. Helicobacter pylori is within the bacteria domain, uh, and as you can see on this slide, it shows the phylum, class, order, family, and then the genus and species, which is Helicobacter pylori. This microorganism is a highly successful and prevalent uh, bacteria. Um, I saw a variety of different uh, estimates in terms of the prevalence, but uh, one that I saw is approximately two thirds of all people in the world are believed to have been infected at some point uh, with higher prevalence in the developing world. Um, the vast majority of people who have this bacteria are asymptomatic, um, but those who do have symptoms can develop chronic gastrointestinal symptoms. H. pylori is believed to be linked to approximately 89% of gastric cancers, 5.5% of all cancers worldwide, uh, making it the only bacterium linked to development of any cancer. Um, H. pylori has an extensive genetic diversity of strains, uh, which helps it thrive. So within one person, there can be a lot of strains and uh, between different people. Um, the genus Helicobacter consists of over 20, or 20 recognized species with many awaiting formal recognition. Um, in addition to a lot of diversity within humans, um, there are related Helicobacter species that have been identified in the stomachs of other um, wild and domesticated mammals. There are a number of features that allow this bacteria to survive and thrive in stomachs. It's microaerophilic, so within the stomach, it only needs a little bit of oxygen, uh, and it contains, contains hydrogenase, which it uses to oxidize hydrogen in the surrounding environment uh, to get its nutritional energy. Um, from that hydrogen, it produces oxidase, catalase, and ureas. Um, the ureas production is key to its survival because it takes it in, breaks it down, uh, and it creates ammonia and carbon dioxide. Uh, that ammonia and the surrounding area um, decrease or increases the pH, uh, making it more basic, uh, less acidic, um, and creates kind of a window of uh, less acidity right around the organism, which allows it to live. Uh, when people have an H. pylori infection, um, it impacts the entire microbiome in a person's stomach. Um, it can be uh, around 40 to 90 percent of all the microbiota um, when it's present. Um, so it reduces the overall diversity. Uh, the change in pH impacts the ability of other uh, microorganisms, microorganisms to survive. Um, and then another way it can impact the stomach is that uh, eradication therapies can also um, further ruin the microbiome. It uses its helical shape and flagella uh, to burrow into the mucus lining of the stomach. Uh, so it gets through the mucus and up to the skin layer. Uh, once it's in the epithelial layer, it produces adhesins, which allow it to stick there uh, and not get washed away. Once it is up against the stomach wall, um, it stays there and produces ammonia, um, which decreases acidity. Uh, the ammonia allows it to stay there, but uh, the ammonia also um, is toxic to the epithelial layer, um, so it ruins the this uh, stomach lining. Um, it creates uh, an immune response, um, more acids, so basically it sits there against your stomach wall, um, and then your stomach acid uh, ruins uh, your stomach lining, creating ulcers. Um, 
with an H. pylori colonization or infection, uh, people can uh, experience abdominal pain, bad taste in the mouth, nausea, heartburn, belching, um, and the infection is related to a number of uh, diseases, chronic gastritis, peptic ulcers, gastric adenocarcinoma, um, gastrointestinal reflux disease, uh, and cancer. H. pylori has been isolated in saliva, gastric mucus, dental plaque, and feces. Uh, it's transmissible through oral oral route or fecal oral route. Um, right now there are no vaccines, um, so hand hygiene, access to clean water are really important. Um, there are a number of different antibiotics um, that can kill uh, an H. pylori infection um, or colonization. Uh, other therapies like proton pump inhibitors, bismuth salt, um, and a number of different foods um, are recommended. Um, and if you're having all of the symptoms in the previous slide, uh, it might be worth going to a doctor and getting checked out. Hey guys, my name is Sanai, and I decided to research on a bacteria that is called Rickettsia. Rickettsia is a bacteria that is found in ticks, lice, fleas, mites, and mammals. This is a gram-negative bacteria. It is an obligate intracellular parasite that synthesizes only a small amount of peptidoglycan. It is non-motile and aerobic. It lives in the cytosol of their host cells since outside of the host cells, it's unstable and dies quickly. This is an extremely small bacteria as it only measures 0 0.3 micrometers times 1.0 micrometer. It is typically a bacilli, broad shaped. These are usually defined by two groups, spotted fever group and a typhus group. Rickettsia is a class alpha proteobacteria of the bacteriophilum proteobacteria. This is based on the sequence of nucleotides in their rRNA molecules. There are four genera, Rickettsia, Arinthia, Ericea, and Anaplasma, which are the main Rickettsias that cause disease to humans. Their genes encode 16S RNA. Two of the, two of the specific species from Rickettsias are R. Cororai caspia, which is an Astraclan spotted fever and R. africae, which is an African tick bite fever. Rickettsia requires a vector of transmission from host to host. Rickettsial species are transmitted by a different antropode vector, and when inside of the host cell, they secrete an enzyme that digests the membrane of the endocytic vesicle, which will release a bacteria into the host cell cytosol. They possess an outer membrane of lipopolysaccharide with endotoxin activity. They reproduce by binary fission. Rickettsia also spreads via the bloodstream to infect the endothelium and sometimes the vascular smooth muscle cells. Rickettsia also are able to synthesize ATP via metabolism of glutamine. There are three main types of Rickettsia. The first one I'll be discussing is Rickettsia prowazikaii. This is this causes epidemic typhus since it's vectored by the human body loci. This usually occurs in scratching inoculates bacterium into the skin. Humans are the primary host and they usually fill the host cells until the cell breaks open. This usually occurs in unsanitary conditions such as South Africa, which favor body lice. Some things that it can manifest is high fever, mental and physical depression, plus rash that can last up to two weeks. Brozinzer is a recurrent disease that is more mild. It is a more mild type of rickettsia. The next type of rickettsia is rickettsia typhi, which is a murine typhus. It is a major reservoir for bacterium in rodents. Cat and, it is a rat and cat flea vector that transmit among an animal host to humans. Following the 12 days after the bite of an infected flea, 
you can see fever, severe headache, chills, muscle pain, and nausea occur. This usually lasts up to three weeks and if left untreated is rarely fatal. There is no vaccination available for this type of disease or bacteria. The main and most common type of severe rickettsia is rickettsia rickettsii, which is the most severe as mentioned. This usually causes the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And this is especially true for people with the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. It is infected by the dermacenter variabilis tick. The treatment choice consists of Doxide cycline, which can be used in people of all ages, including young children. This bacteria spreads via the bloodstream and damages the lungs, brain, and other organs. Mortality rates are as high as 20 to 30 percent. The image that I have included here talks about the merging and the remerging rickettsia cycle, which starts with an uninfected tick, which will then attach to an infected rodent, and then potentially infecting the tick as well, which would then attack an uninfected rodent, and it would just become a cycle where they would lay their eggs and then proceed to infect an adult, which will then lead to an infected adult. And it's just a cycle that keeps continuing and going on and on. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Salmonella is a genus of modal gram-negative bacilli in the Enterobacteriaceae family that typically resides in the intestines of various birds, reptiles, and mammals being expelled through feces. They are facultative anaerobes capable of thriving in both oxygen-rich and oxygen-depleted environments. They have complex nutritional needs, which allow them to adapt to different environments. For growth, Salmonella requires carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, vitamins, and trace elements. They are heterotrophic organisms, meaning that they obtain carbon from organic compounds rather than fixing it from inorganic sources. While Salmonella doesn't ferment lactose, Salmonella bacteria are capable of fermenting glucose with the production of gas. Regarding metabolism, Salmonella possesses various metabolic pathways, enabling it to utilize different substrates for energy production and growth. It can perform oxidative phosphorylation, and utilize aerobic and anaerobic respiration to generate energy. Despite there being more than 2,500 identified Salmonella stain, strains, they all belong to a single species, Salmonella enterica. While most strains may not display symptoms, larger infective doses can lead to Salmonellosis. Symptoms of Salmonella infection include diarrhea, abdominal cramps, a prolonged fever, muscle cramps, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, chills, headache, and more. Certain groups, infants, young children, older adults, pregnant women, etc., and individuals with weakened immune systems are at higher risk of complications from a salmonella infection. Salmonella engages in diverse interaction within natural settings, such as soil, water, and animal habitats competing for resources and space among a range of microorganisms. Within microbial communities, Salmonella de demonstrates both synergistic and antagonistic relationships. Salmonella can also form biofilms, which contributes to its resilience by creating conditions suitable for Salmonella proliferation. 
the protective matrix in biofilms acts as a barrier requiring higher concentrations or prolonged exposure times of disinfectants to eliminate said biofilms. So, Salmonella's biofilm structure enables its survival by providing protection against disinfectants, antibiotics, and environmental stressors, making eradication challenging. Ongoing research is focusing on developing effective strategies against Salmonella biofilms, such as developing anti-biofilm agents and understanding the genetic mechanisms that govern bio biofilm formation. So Salmonella is a pathogenic bacteria. It typically attaches to and takes over a cell, eventually killing it. It wants to find a suitable condition for growth, so it colonizes and establishes itself within the host body, particularly in the intestines. Salmonella can collaborate with certain microbes for mutual benefit, but in most cases, it blocks or hinders the growth of other microorganisms, similar to natural settings. Salmonella interacts with the body's microbiota, competing for nutrients, space, and attachment sites with beneficial gut bacteria. These interactions alter the gut microbiome's composition and balance, impacting the host's susceptibility to salmonella infections and overall health. Salmonella showcases remarkable adaptability, adjusting its virulence in response to the host environment. It can regulate gene expression in reaction to environmental cues encountered within the host to enhance survival and evade host defenses. This adaptability is pivotal for Salmonella's persistence within host cells, contributing to its ability to thrive and endure in diverse environments within the human body. Once ingested into the human body, Salmonella travels to the intestines where it deploys various mechanisms to attach to and invade the epithelial cells lining the gut. Salmonella can withstand stomach acidity, which is aided by protective measures such as acid tolerance responses. Through its type 3 secretion system, Salmonella injects proteins into the host cells that then prompts endocytosis, allowing it to enter and eventually reproduce within these cells through binary fission. Once inside the host cell, Salmonella manipulates host cell signaling pathways, altering cellular functions to evade immune detection and resist destruction. This involves inhibiting the activation of immune cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, and T cells, and thereby evading clearance. Additionally, Salmonella possesses mechanisms to resist the antimicrobial activities within phagocytes. And furthermore, Salmonella secretes effectors that disrupt host cell processes such as cytoskeletal rearrangements and membrane trafficking. The invasion of host cells by Salmonella triggers an inflammatory response, inducing characteristic symptoms like fever, cramps, diarrhea, and vomiting. In severe cases, certain strains may enter the bloodstream, causing bacteremia and leading to localized infections across the body. Thank you for listening.
Clostridium difficile, aka C. diff, is the main culprit of a healthcare associated infection that causes severe diarrhea. C. diff was discovered by Louis Pasteur in the 1860s and was first isolated from the intestinal flora of newborns in 1935. It was originally named Bacillus difficilis because it was difficult to culture and study. C. diff is a gram-positive obligate anaerobe bacillus-shaped bacterium and has a vegetative form and spore form. Because it's an ob obligate anaerobe, it cannot survive in the environment for very long when it's in its vegetative state. When it's in its spore form, it is metabolically inactive and can withstand oxidative stress, extreme temperatures, defecation, and acidic environments. The C. diff spores in the stool of those who are infected can live in the environment for extended periods of time as they can survive harsh conditions, including the surfaces that are sanitized with alcohol. C. diff is part of the phylum Firmicutes and has many, many relatives, including Clostridium perfringens, which can cause food poisoning and diarrhea, and Clostridium tetani, which can be found in soil and cause spastic paralysis. When C. diff enters its host, it navigates through the acidic environment of the stomach and then travels to the small intestine where it germinates. For germination to occur, germinants and the proper nutri nutrients must be present in the environment. Um, bile acids along with glycine and other amino acids trigger the germination of C. diff spores. Glycine and the am other amino acids act as co-germinants. The spores then move into the anaerobic environment of the large intestine where they multiply and colonize. They then attach to the epithelium of the colon and secrete toxins that cause the infection. C. diff is found in soil, feces, sewage, and food and is transmitted through the fecal oral route. CCPA is the main carbon catalyte regulator that also um, reduces the toxin gene expression. It uses the Stickland reaction, uh, which oxidizes and reduces glycine pr and proline, which produce ATP and NAD+. When there's a limited supply of proline or proline reductase, alternative pathways are used to regenerate NAD+, which produces butyrate, which then stimulates the synthesis of the toxins of C. diff. Antibiotic use decreases the overall diversity of the intestinal microbiome. Specifically, broad-spectrum antibiotics decrease the amount of bacteriodetes, which allows germination and growth of pathogenic microorganisms such as C. diff. When the gut microbiota changes, the number of metabolites in the intestine are also affected, which alters bacterial fermentation. This decreases the amount of fatty acids while increasing carbohydrates and amino acids, which allows C. diff to use um, these metabolites for germination, colonization, and growth. Those who are at high risk for contracting C. diff infection include the elderly with multiple comorbidities who frequently undergo urgent surgery. Those who become infected with C. diff tend to be readmitted to the hospital, which provides the pathogen with more opportunities to spread to its next victims. The bacteria Chlamydia is a genus of microorganisms that belongs in the Chlamydiae phylum. Chlamydia displays characteristics somewhat in between a virus and a bacterium and was previously classified as a virus because of these shared traits. Chlamydia, among the smallest microbes, is obligate intracellular, non-motile, does not have peptidoglycan, is gram-negative bacteria, and they rely on their target host cells in eukaryotes to grow and multiply. They are cellular and contain DNA, RNA, functional 70 subunit ribosomes, 
and are enclosed in two membranes. In its life cycle, chlamydia cells take on two different shapes or bodies. The elementary bodies are small, cockeye or circular shaped, while the reticulate bodies are about twice the size and can take on more than one shape. The EB has a thick, rigid cell wall with high amounts of cystein protein and a cytoplasmic membrane. The EBs are resistant to digestion by trypsin, mechanical stress, and oxidative stress, while the RBs are sensitive to these components. The EB The EB is unable to reproduce and lack metabolic pathways. RBs do have the ability to reproduce and are metabolically active. Some chlamydia have DNA plasmids and hemagglutinin to assist in attaching to the host cells. Because chlamydia does not possess its own metabolic and biosynthetic pathways, it relies on host cells for ATP and further development. The, de the developmental cycle of chlamydia is special in which the cells morph from two different body forms. The elementary body is non-replicating and infectious, and the reticulate body is the intracytoplasmic form that initiates replication and growth. The EB houses RNA polymerase that enables the DNA genome to be transcribed once it enters the cell cytoplasm and engages the cell growth cycle. The RB is also responsible for retaining the DNA genome, proteins, and ribosomes. The cycle lasts 48 to 72 hours and begins with the infectious EB attaching to a host cell, then undergoes endocytosis into the host cell. Once inside the host cell, the EB transitions into an RB, which then quickly multiplies, and an inclusion body is formed. The RB uses the energy sources from the host cell and amino acids to replicate and develop into new infectious EBs that will go on to infect more cells. Between 36 and 50 hours after the time of infection is when the maximum amount of EBs is formed. Antibiotics and dietary factors can disrupt the maturation of EBs and prevent them from transforming into the invasive RBs. These factors can cause the endospore form to lack pathogenicity. There are three species of chlamydia that can cause disease in humans. Chlamydia trachomatis, Chlamydia psittaci and Chlamydia pneumoniae. The most common of these species is C. trachomatis and is only prevalent in humans. C. trachomatis is the leading cause of sexually transmitted infections and most cases of blindness from infection in the world. C. trachomatis is transmitted via direct contact with the infected tissue. The transmission can occur from vaginal, anal, or oral sex, and a newborn can be exposed during vaginal birth if the mother was infected. Most infected will remain asymptomatic reservoirs, but there are a number of infections that can develop. Among these diseases are cervicitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, urethritis, parahepatitis, epidemitis, epidemitis, <laughs> prostatitis, prostatitis, reactive arthritis, conjunctivitis, pneumonia, pharyngitis, and lymphogranuloma venarium. In women with a genital tract infection caused by C. trachomatis, Around 85% don't display symptoms, but in men, more than 75% infected will be symptomatic. In a C. trachomatis infection, the immune, re immune response uses nonspecific, specific, humoral, and cellular mechanisms.
The second most prevalent species of chlamydia is C. pneumoniae, which is transmitted from person to person through respiratory droplets. The infection can lead to pneumonia, bronchitis, and other respiratory tract infections. Typically, these cases are mild and can be treated with antibiotics, but it is difficult to prevent due to its ability to spread so easily. The third species of chlamydia, C. psittaci, infects birds in the respiratory tract. If a human comes into contact with an infected bird, living or dead, they can develop some symptoms of ornithosis. Ornithosis. Usually, the symptoms are mild flu-like, but can also lead to pneumonia in some cases. There are strains of C. psittaci that can cause an animal to miscarry. On occasion, other conditions such as endocarditis, hepatitis, arthritis, conjunctivitis, and encephalitis can occur. Since C. psittaci is found in birds, those who have a lot of exposure to birds are the most at risk of contracting an infection. Ornithosis can be treated with antibiotics like tetracycline, but if left untreated can lead to death in some cases. Hi, this is Iris from Microbiology. I chose Rhizobium as my favorite microbe. Um, nitrogen makes up around 78% of all atmospheric gases. Almost all of that nitrogen exists in its diatomic form, N2. No plants or animals are able to utilize nitrogen directly. The only organism capable of utilizing nitrogen are groups of prokaryotes called diazotrophs. Some plants have evolved to form symbiotic relationships with diazotrophs. The main example of this is legume rhizobium symbiosis. Rhizobia get nutrients from the cells of legume roots and fix atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia, which is used by their plant hosts. Rhizobia exists, that exist in free living forms in the soil are incapable of nitrogen fixation. However, during symbiosis, rhizobium undergoes physiological and structural changes that allow it to do so. Bacteria in the genus Rhizobium are rod shaped. Um, they usually have flagella and are mobile. Once it's in the legume host, rhizobium transforms into an irregular branch shape. Rhizobia are, are gram-negative genus of bacteria. Um, Rhizobium's traits of nitrogen fixing and legume association are not phylogenetically significant. Some archaea, cyanobacteria, and several other bacterial groups who are not phylogenetically related to rhizobium also have the ability to fix nitrogen, which suggests that this trait is a result of convergent evolution. Rhizobium's capacity to associate with legumes is most likely the result of horizontal gene transfer amongst bacteria, as opposed to vertical gene transfer, which is much more phylogenetically significant. The rhizobia group has been described as both paraphyletic and polyphyletic. The rhizobium genus splits into three subgenuses, rhizobium, Brady rhizobium, and azorhizobium. All three fall under the category of proteobacteria, but on distinct branches, each of which also includes bacterial species that are not rhizobia. Rhizobia are heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are organisms that cannot make their own food. Heterotrophs get their nutrients from other sources of organic carbon. Rhizobium is a chemoheterotroph, which means it gets energy and nutrients from preformed organic energy sources, which have been synthesized by other organisms. Rhizobia that exist in free living forms in soil feed on dead organic material and use it for growth and to provide substrates that are oxidized in cellular respiration to generate ATP. Um, when rhizobia form symbiotic relationships with legumes, the photosynthetic hosts provide them with carbohydrates and all the necessary nutrients except nitrogen, which rhizobium obtain from the atmosphere. Even within individual species of rhizobium, specific strains can either be mutualistic, parasitic, or non-symbiotic. Mutualistic rhizobia provide hosts with lots of fixed nitrogen. Parasitic rhizobia rely on hosts, but fix little to no nitrogen to provide to their hosts. Non-symbiotic rhizobia only exist in free living forms in soil and are unable to infect legumes at all. Legumes favor more mutualistic rhizobia. Mutualistic and parasitic rhizobia can produce millions of descendants. However, the rate of viability among said offspring is very low. All in all, non-symbiotic rhizobia often have more successful rates of reproduction. 
So um, here is an in-depth look step-by-step -step at the relationship between rhizobia bacteria and legumes. The process of root formation is initiated when a legume releases a chemical, including amino acids, dicarboxylic acids, and low concentrations of excreted components called flavonoids through their roots, which the rhizobia in the soil are attracted to. Rhizobium accumulate near the root hair and eventually attach to the roots, uh, the root hair cell wall. Chemicals called nodulation factors are released from the rhizobium cells, which cause the root hair to curl. Now the rhizobium cells are able to digest the cell wall of the root hair and enter into the root hair. Rhizobium enters the root hair through invagination, which is the process of the cell membrane of the root hair being turned inside out or folded back on itself to form a cavity. Um, the rhizobium bacteria enter the root through this form cavity, which is termed the infection thread. Spontaneously, the cells of the pericycle layer of the cortex of the root become de-differentiated, which leads to the formation of masses of undifferentiated cells called nodule primordia. The nodule primordia divide to produce outgrowths called root nodules. The rhizobia and the root nodule cells undergo physiological and structural transformation and are now called bacterioids. So the bacterioids are irregular shaped, non-flagellated, branched and non-dividing forms of rhizobium. They produce the enzyme nitrogenase or nitrogenase. Um, nitrogenase is responsible for the actual fixation of nitrogen into ammonia. This enzyme is very sensitive to the presence of oxygen and will actually become inactive when exposed to any oxygen. To avoid this, the bacterioids and the legume cells work to form a pink pigment leg hemoglobin that is an oxygen scavenger that removes any excess oxygen from the nodule cells. So that's how that works. The symbiotic relationship between legumes and rhizobia fuels the practice of crop rotation, which is used in many agricultural traditions. Crop rotation with legumes allows farmers to nourish plants who can in turn nourish the soil in a process that uses a biological catalyst at room temperature and ordinary pressures and uses sunlight to drive it. Farmers have been using legumes in agriculture since the ancient world to rotate crops to assure the fertility of their soils. Um, in the new world, farmers use the common bean. In the Mediterranean, they use lupins. In China, they use soybean crops. In South Africa, I'm sorry, in South Asia and Africa, um, cow pea was used. Crop rotation with legumes takes the place of relying on industrial nitrogen fertilizers, which is in the next slide. Overuse of nitrogen fertilizers can lead to the release of greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide and the eutrophication of waterways. Nitrous oxide's warming potential is around 300 times greater than that of carbon dioxide. Eutrophication is unwanted fertilization of a waterway that can lead to overgrowth of ecologically harmful microorganisms like algae and cyanobacteria and eventually lead to the loss of all other aquatic life. The use of legumes that are symbiotically associated with rhizobia, which are naturally occurring soil nitrogen fixing bacteria in crop rotation practices may help reduce the amount of industrially fixed nitrogen that is used um, and that leads to loss of nitrogen into our atmosphere and waterways. So in conclusion, um, here's a picture of my back garden bed. I started growing some peas recently and have been very pleased to learn about rhizobia, which will hopefully continue to be utilized in the future um, and on a more broad scale as a sustainable way to optimize agricultural food output and reduce reliance on more environmentally harmful environmental, or I'm sorry, agricultural practices like industrially fixed nitrogen fertilizers. Um, this microbe has a lot of potential. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Here are some references for you. And thanks again.
Tuberculosis tales. Mycobacterium's whispered trails. I'm the cause of tuberculosis, TB, which the World Health Organization, WHO, classified as a deadly respiratory disease after I threatened the world in 1993. In fact, I'm so famous that the WHO publishes epidemic reports all about me every year. The 2019 report estimated that 10 million people were infected and around 1.4 million people suffered mortality. According to some models, the COVID-19 epidemic may worsen TB burden due to undernutrition, multidrug-resistant TB strains, unemployment, and redirection of resources to fight COVID-19. Who am I? Mycobacterium tuberculosis. I am a gram-positive, acid-fast bacillus with a very tough cell wall composed of lipopolysaccharide, mycolic acids, arabinogalactan, a polymer of arabinose and galactose, a thick peptidoglycan layer, and a lipid bilayer. Over 60% of my cell wall is made of mycolic acids, which contribute to my virulence. Other lipids in my cell wall, such as sulfolipids, cholesterol, and liporabinomannan, also help to increase my virulence. They help me be resistant to antibiotics, resistant to osmotic lysis, and oxidative stress. I hail from the bacteria kingdom, Actinobacteria phylum and class, Actinomycetales order, Mycobacteriaceae family, Mycobacterium genus, and tuberculosis species. I have several other relatives that form what is called the tuberculosis complex, because we all cause tuberculosis disease in either humans or animals. They are M. africanum, M. bovis, M. mungi, M. canetti, M. origis, M. microti, M. cabrae, and M. pinnipedi. One of my relatives causes leprosy, and their name is Mycobacterium lepera. Not all of us cause tuberculosis, though, such as Mycobacterium smegmatis and Mycobacterium fortuitum, but they can cause human infections. Humans are my only known host, and I am spread primarily through respiratory droplets, such as sneezing or coughing. I am famous for invading the alveolar sacs of the lungs, but also invade the lymph nodes, bones, joints, central nervous system, heart pericardium, or bloodstream. I cause humans to cough, have chest pain, lose weight, fever, and even night sweats. If in the lymph nodes, the person can get abscesses. If in the central nervous system, I get quite a headache. My metabolism is heavily dependent on lipids, which are my primary carbon and energy sources. I'm such a chemo heterotroph. I steal lipids from my host because they are delicious, but I can also make my own. In fact, I can use cholesterol as my sole carbon source. Important enzymes responsible for fatty acid biosynthesis are FAS1 and FAS2, which produce some mycolic acids that make up part of my cell wall, such as pedum, sulfolipids, polyacyl trehalose, and diacyl trehalose. Scientists predict that under aerobic and early growth conditions, I use glucose and triglycerides as carbon and energy sources, but then switch to using lipids once inside host macrophages where I cannot access glucose. Take that, macrophages. I can still replicate. Sometimes, a bunch of macrophages will chase me down and form granulomas by clustering together in large groups of foamy cells which starve me of oxygen. I must change up my metabolism if I want to survive, so I alter my Krebs cycle to favor sustenate production. Sustenate feeds sustenate dehydrogenase, which is involved in both the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. This means I still get to make ATP. To increase the success of my invasion, I must reduce the population of my enemies. Studies in TB patients have shown that I am associated with a decrease in microbiome diversity, especially short-chain fatty acid or SCFA-producing bacteria such as Firmicutes and Bacteroides. You see, SCFAs, such as butyrate, are helpful in immunomodulation, meaning that they help stimulate lymphocytes and phagocytes. I don't want that. Gut and lung dysbiosis are my friends. I don't dislike all microbes in the human microbiome, though. I do like proteobacteria, so they are overrepresented during MTB infection. During anaerobic growth, they produce mixed acids, including sustenate, lactate, formate, but also dreaded SCFAs. However, as I mentioned before, I do like sustenate for my own ATP production. I also like some actinobacteria, such as from the genus Colincella. No one knows exactly why these groups are overrepresented, and I'm not telling. I have many clever ways to escape the human immune system. One way is by purposely allowing myself to be internalized by alveolar macrophages, but then preventing the maturation of the phagosome. You see, during normal phagocytosis, the phagosome fuses with the lysosome to form a phagolysosome, which contains an acidic environment and enzymes that can kill me. One way I prevent lysosomes from killing me is by secreting a lysosomotropic, can penetrate lysosomes lipid called 1-T-BAD, which functions as an antacid. Another way I do it is by secreting a protein tyrosine phosphatase. PTPA, which prevents the ATPAs in macrophages from doing its job of actively pumping protons and acidifying the phagosomal environment. Since I can damage phagosomes with my ESX1 effector proteins, macrophages try to come and repair them via the endosomal sorting complex required for transport, or ESCRT, and GAL3 proteins. However, my handy effectors ESXH and ESXG interfere with the recruitment of ESCRT. This prevents maturation into a phagolysosome and thus keeps the pH high enough to keep me comfy. Humans have found that ESXH and ESXG complex with each other and prevent ESCRT recruitment, thus disrupting its function, which also includes moving me to lysosomes. GAL3 gets recruited to damaged phagosomes when internal glycoproteins get exposed, but my effectors block that signaling too.
Hi, hi. My name is Dawson. Uh, today I'll be presenting my least favorite microorganism, Treponema pallidum. An overview. I'll be talking about history, background information, the microbiology behind it, transmission, diagnosis, and treatment. History and background. Commonly known as syphilis, this bacterium is the reason why there are over 200,000 cases of this STD yearly. The first recorded outbreak of this disease dates back to the French invasion in 1494 in Naples, Italy. In 1905, Schauden and Hoffman discovered the etiologic agent of syphilis, where they named it Spirocheta pallida. A cure was founded for this disease in, four, in 1943, giving four patients penicillin. T. pallidum is a bacteria that causes syphilis. Microbiology behind it. Uh, Treponema pallidum is a gram-negative bacteria, but is not similar to your average gram-negative bacteria. T. pallidum is from the spirochete family. They are helically coiled corkscrew-shaped cells. They can be up to 6 to 15 micrometers long and 1 to 2 micrometers wide with flagella surrounding it. Uh, the flagella gives the bacteria its shape of mobility. The spiral shape gives the bacteria the ability to spin and penetrate skin. Uh, it is anaerobic, meaning that it can it can grow without oxygen. It cannot be grown as a pure culture due to not meeting conscious postulates. Uh, T. pallidum DNA was detected with the use of primers to the gene coding protein with a molecular weight of 47 KD and T. pallidum RNA with the primers to the gene of 16S RNA. It is difficult to culture because it does not use your usual gram staining technique to identify the bacteria and classification. Uh, techniques such as the silver impregnation stain or the reuse stain will have a better result when observing the bacteria's cells. Since T. pallidum usually affects the living host, they are usually interacting with the human platelets. Transmission. There are four ways to contract this disease. Uh, number one, sexual conduct in any way. Uh, two, contaminated needles. Three, a baby can catch the infection in the womb. Uh, four, direct contact with a skin lesion. Uh, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, there are three stages when contracting syphilis. Uh, the first stage is, uh, is usually painless. Uh, you can there's usually chances of you getting sores or uh, chance chancers uh, around your genital areas or where you got where uh, there was contact with uh, the bacteria. Uh, the second stage is a body rash. It's not painful, but it's severely irritating. And the third stage is it can be fatal. Uh, it can occur 10 to 30 years after being in contact with the disease. Uh, it affects organs such as the brain, the eyes, the heart. There are serological tests that people can take to see if they have the disease, and there are antibiotics and a cure to syphilis, but it is best to get treatment right away if you do find out you have syphilis. In summary, I talked about the history and background information, the microbiology behind it, transmission, and diagnosis and treatment. Mysteria gonorrhea is a gram-negative bacteria and part of the Mysteria genus. It's one of two pathogenic species of the genus, and it causes a sexually transmitted infection, gonorrhea. The bacteria only impacts human, and as an obligate human colonizer, it cannot survive outside the host. In the United States, gonorrhea, along with chlamydia, are two very common STIs. There continues to be increasing rates in both. Management is challenging because many infections are asymptomatic and antimicrobial resistant strains of gonorrhea continue to develop and change. The sheep of Nisteria gonorrhea bacteria is diplococci, and they are held within a polysaccharide capsule and lipogalliac saccharide cell wall made of lipid A. This layer enables the bacteria to attach and invade human cells. 
Other virulence factors that enable adherence to human cells include fibria, which are rod-like extensions. The bacteria also has pilus, which are a special type of fibria that are fewer and longer and enable the transfer of DNA to other cells in the process called conjugation. The pili specific to Neisteria gonorrhea, not pictured here, um, is a type 4 pili which allows for the creation of microcolonies on the epithelial cell surface. They also have highly variable surface antigens, and this prevents the development of immunity and effective vaccine. The bacteria can infect the mucous membrane of the mouth, throat, eyes, and rectum. Sexual contact with the penis, vagina, mouth, or anus of an infected partner is the main way it's transmitted. It can be transmitted during childbirth and infect the infant. Neisseria gonorrhea grows after transmission, and the contact is established with the mucosal epithelia. First, the bacterial must adhere to the epithelia of the mucosa with the help of the type 4 pili and the lipoallosaccharide LOS. Once that is complete, um, the pili help establish microcolonies. Diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of gonorrhea prove complicated. As it's a very common STI and many people do not seek screening because they are asymptomatic. Regular screening is therefore important and samples and specimens can detect the presence of a gram-negative diplococci. Once detected, treatment is tricky too because the widespread gonococcal strain resistance to antibiotics. Because the bacteria have highly variable surface antigens, as mentioned before, immunity doesn't often develop. And if it does, it doesn't often have broad protection. The impact of infection can be both symptomatic and asymptomatic. In men, symptoms can be acute inflammation and infection in the urethra causing painful urination. Men can experience an asymptomatic infection. Uh, women are more likely to experience asymptomatic infection. However, if they do have symptoms, it could look like dysteria, increased vaginal discharge, or vaginal bleeding between periods. Although women may not experience symptoms, the infection can lead to additional condition such as pelvic inflammatory disease. This happens when the infection travels by bacteria attaching to the sperm via the fimbrae or the LOS to the uterine tubes and cause inflammation, which can lead to ectopic pregnancy after scarring or infertility. Disseminated gonococcal infection, DGI, can happen if gonorrhea goes untreated and spreads to the bloodstream. Consequences of DGI include arthritis, dermatitis, taniovitis, and the condition can be life-threatening. Considering many people do not experience symptoms, this is a very dire consequence. Because so much of gonorrhea is asymptomatic, regular screening is essential for management. This visual shows the history of discovered and recommended antimicrobials and the evolution of the resistance in Neisteria gonorrhea. As you can see from 1990 through to 2020, there have been numerous um, antimicrobials that have become um, no longer active. Um, with the ever-changing landscape of antimicrobial resistance, prevention, screening, and treatment are essential. It is a major public health concern globally.